Information contained in this podcast is not medical advice. It is for educational and informational purposes only. Please consult with your doctor before making any health choices. You're listening to the Take Back Your Health Now podcast, the show that interviews the top doctors, athletes, trainers, and entrepreneurs to help you find the holy grail of health. Now here's your host, Dr. Dan Margolin. Hi, this is Dr. Dan Margolin with another segment of Take Back Your Health Now, where we pull out all the stops in search of health's holy grail. We're very excited. Today we have Dr. Bill Andros. He's the president and CEO of Sierra Sciences. As a scientist, athlete, and executive, he continually pushes the envelope and challenges convention. He has been featured in Popular Science, The Today Show, and numerous documentaries on the topic of life extension, including most recently the movie The Immortalist, in which he co-stars with Aubrey de Grey. Since 1981, Bill Andrews has focused on finding ways to extend the human lifespan and health span through telomere maintenance. As one of the principal discoverers of both the RNA and protein components of human telomerase, Dr. Andrews was awarded second place as National Inventor of the Year in 1997. He earned his PhD in molecular and population genetics at the University of Georgia in 1981, he has served as senior scientist at Armos Corporation and Codon Corporation, director of molecular biology at Berkslix Biosciences and at Garan Corporation, and director of technology development at EOS Biosciences. He is also a named inventor on over 50 plus U.S. issued patents on telomerase and, and author of numerous scientific research studies published in peer reviewed scientific journals. He's also the author of the book Curing Aging and telomere lengthening, curing all diseases, including cancer and aging. What an awesome bio. Dr. Andrews, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. I'm glad to be on. We're very excited to have you. So, wow, we're, we're going into something that I'm just so fascinated by, right? You're, you're actually talking about uh, potentially reversing aging. And I know, you know, I, I'd love to just go back a little bit and find out how you got into it. But the concept of aging almost as a disease is so shocking to me. Could you explain, just go and go, go over your history and how you sort of came to this conclusion? Well, it, it actually all starts with my father. Um, when, when I was a kid, um, my, you know, I was different from the other kids in the family. I was extremely interested in science and medicine. And my parents kind of actually used to call me the uh, because of that. <laughs> One day I was- nice. Very I was, nice. <laughs> Did you ever lose that twitch? <laughs> no, no, no. But I, I just was obsessed. And I, you know, I got to say, it probably, my mother tells me, it all goes back to one teacher I had in elementary school that just really uh, got me obsessed with science and medicine. And, and it's, it's amazing how much an elementary school teacher can influence a person's life. But I wish I remembered who she was or something like that, because she's probably the person who gets credit for everything I do. <laughs> but, really? Uh, really? Yeah, but my, funny? Yeah, I know. When I was out in the front lawn of our house looking through a telescope, you know, discovering Saturn's rings and Jupiter's moons and things like that, he came just up to me and he said, you know, Bill, when you grow up, you should become a doctor and find a cure for aging. He used the word cure. He called it a disease. And he also said, I don't know why nobody's done this yet. He acted like it was like something wow. simple. And, wow. and I was 10 years old at the time. Um, and I know I was that age because I know that I know what the house where, where I was. And I know that we moved to another house when I was 11. So it was when I was 10 or maybe it's just younger than that. But Wow. Isn't that funny? That it's funny. Like when there's those changing points in your life and you can you can just sort of pinpoint it exactly like that. Right. It's amazing. That, that's, that's why he's in the movie The Immortalist that you mentioned, uh, because he was the one that inspired me. And, and one of the big goals was to cure his aging, but unfortunately he passed away about two years ago from Alzheimer's. And I, I'm, st I'm still looking at the fact that 150,000 people die every day. And so I'm still moving forward on my mission, though he'll never, he'll no longer benefit from it, unfortunately. Bill, did, did you ever go back and ask him like what made him present it the way he did? Yeah, I, yeah but he just, his whole life, he was always upset that aging was occurring. 
and he wanted to find a cure. And he, he was always cure it and stuff. And he, he was just really frustrated. He was not a scientist himself. Uh, he was actually a television producer. And huh. he later made some documentaries on the subject of aging. Uh, he got very well known in the anti-aging research community uh, as being somebody that was helping people get going. Um, and, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, that's kind of how it started, but things that, you know, I, I started doing, I just got obsessed with the subject. And so everybody knew me in you know, school, high school, college, everything as somebody who was obsessed with trying to figure out what causes aging and how to cure it. And I, I had always decided that there had to be some kind of clock that was ticking inside of us because none of the other theories made sense to me. I, I, I'm a big believer in twos and twos have to all add up, okay? If they don't, then the theory doesn't make sense. Right. And I couldn't understand why, you know, if most of the theories had something to do with the environment, okay? We either internal environment or external environment. We, but we, they said we age like no differently than like old trucks sitting in a field. And okay. I just could never buy that. Okay, one, if that was true, why is it people who live in the North and South Poles age at the same rate that people live on the equators, on the equator, when, when they're in different, very different environments? And if environment was the sole cause of aging, why is it that dogs and cats age at a very different rate from the same environment? Uh, it's, there, there just wasn't, something wasn't right there. And, and you know, we also, we're not like old trucks sitting in a field. When we get a sunburn, well, when a truck gets exposed to the sun, it, it fades, it never gets repaired. When we get right. a sunburn, we have cells that can divide to replace those dead cells. So right. we, there's, we're not like trucks. Something had to be done. There had to be some kind of clock that was ticking inside of us, and it was controlling the aging process, and that clock was just set differently in cats and dogs. And, and you know, but also, honestly, like I've seen people age, you know, at different rates, just in just in observ observing. I mean, just the best example I could say is Christy Brinkley does not look to me like she aged at all, right? I mean, you look, she's got to be in her 60s. How How is that even possible? I mean, maybe there's surgeries and things like that. But but I, I always tell the story. When I was in my 20s, I was in the gym. You know, I was into lifting and stuff. And this old guy came in. This old guy, probably 50, uh, 55 now, so he's probably my age, a little bit older than that. And he had an old face, but he took his shirt off. And I swear to God, if you didn't see his face, you would have thought he was 20 years old. And it always stuck with me at that point that there's something not true about this aging process. So what you're what you're saying to me is totally hitting home. I, I totally get your viewpoint. Well, well, the fact that, you know, I was saying that people say age at the same rates, but within reason. OK, so so let, that's another one of my really big strengths is statistics and understanding statistical theory. I'm I've, all through high school and college. I was acing any discussions about bell curves and population studies and things like that. That's part of why my PhD is partially in population genetics. You would never think that a molecular biologist would have an interest in that, but I'm just, I'm just a really good at statistics. And I could really easily see that the bell curve was too narrow, okay, to be explained by environment. And that, that always bothered me. Yes, you're right that some people age quickly, some people age slowly, but still that curve, the, the tightness of the bell curve is just too much to be explained by random events such as the environment. Mm -hmm. So there still had to be some kind of clock. And Christy Brinkley probably does a lot of work to stay as young as she looks, okay? Um, and, and so do I, you know, I, I, I'm told all the time that I don't look 65, uh, and I always say, well, it wasn't easy, you know? Uh, I just, well, you're I, also, I mean, you're also like an ultra marathoner, so. Well, that's part of my secret. I think, I think endurance exercise is one of the best things people can do to healthy as long as they do it properly, okay? You can also over, do it wrong and accelerate your aging and accelerating, accelerate your declining health. But it's like, uh, you just gotta take it easy. And, and when it comes to running, my motto is always, if it quits being fun, quit and save yourself for another day uh, because you're only doing your harm, self harm. But if you just quit and take it easy and save yourself for another day, you're gonna find out that after maybe a year or two or three of doing this kind of stuff, you're gonna find it's easy to run a hundred miles. You know, fun doing it. Um, <clears throat> but uh, th there's so much to it. Um, but regarding this clock that I was mentioning, 
I really got really frustrated because I, I started, especially after I got my PhD, I started interviewing researchers all over the world doing anti-aging stuff, trying to figure out if anybody has any clue as to what this clock could be. And nobody did. And so when I got my PhD, I decided to go into biotech instead of doing research in aging because I thought I'd just sit on the sidelines and wait until some clues to what this clock could be and then jump right in. So I focused on uh -huh. cancer research, heart disease research, inflammation research, really made a big dent in that. I was, made, I was involved in a lot of the big blockbusters in the early days of, of biotech. And, uh, but then one day in 19, early 1990s, I was at a, attending a conference and this guy named Dr. Calvin Harley talked about the fact that telomeres shorten with your age. And he said, it's that I can take blood from anybody in the audience and I can measure your telomeres and tell you how old you are better than any fortune wow. teller ever could. And he said, I can also tell you how long it'll be before you die of old age, if you want to know. And uh, <clears throat> just from the length of the telomeres. So um, and now, just, just what is a telomere? What just how would you describe this? Well, the telomere is actually at the very tips of the chromosome. And I was going to actually come to that in a second. Oh, uh, go to go ahead. Go ahead. I'm like, jumping in. I'm getting, I'm getting too excited about this. Yeah. Well, no, it, it's it's just like because this is important. Get tremendous credit because he came up with the idea that this telomeres shortening might be the clock of aging. So here was somebody else who th was thinking like I was, uh, and uh, so I just went up to him and said, you know, can I come and help you? And he said, sure. And it was the shortest job interview ever. And I started working with him, but. What a telomere is, and you, in order to do this, you got to zoom in on a human body, okay? Because it's really the telomeres are really, really small. They're inside every cell of our body, and when you zoom in, you're actually made up of a hundred trillion cells. And these cells, you know, they divide. They they're involved in. We don't get bigger because the cells get bigger. We get bigger because the the number of cells increases by cell division. And that they're involved in the repair of wounds. And when we shed skin, they repair the, the lost skin. They, they're involved in our immune system. Uh, <clears throat> but and, and most of the theories on why we age, even though they, they the environment, they age because our cells age. So solving the problem of what our cells, how, how our cells age is chief importance. And that was what Calvin Harley was doing. And he discovered that, well, when he, you zoom in on the cells, you find that every cell contains a nucleus. And inside the nuclei are found our chromosomes. And that's where all of our genes are stored that give us our hair color, our eye color, and things like that. Right. Well, our gene, our, our a DNA molecule, and the DNA is, think of it like a long shoelace. And the genes are localized along the shoelace. So, you know, you move from left to right along the shoelace, you see one gene, then another, then another, then another. That's, what, that's where all of our genes are, and they're inside the nuclei of our cells. Well, shoelaces always have these caps on the end of the uh, shoelaces. They're called aglets, and they protect the shoelace. Well, it turns out this long DNA molecule has a, a cap too, and that's called the telomere. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so, so the telomeres are essentially the caps on our chromosomes, the caps on our DNA. And the cap size, the telomere size, is about 15,000 bases in length, at least when we're first conceived. Bases are actually units of measurement. Uh, a typical chromosome is about 100 million bases in length. The telomere is about 15,000 bases in length. Okay. Okay, so, but, but that's true only when or that single cell embryo. It turns out every single time our cells divide, that telomere gets a little bit shorter. And uh, uh, it gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And there's so much cell division that occurs be, be, you know, from going from a single cell embryo to a newborn baby, that our telomeres shorten already down to 10,000 bases before we're even born. So when we're born- Wow, so you lose about a third just in that process you're losing about a third of your telomere. Yes, and it, it turns out, we know now that when the telomeres get genes, ex the production of genes, the expression of genes, the function of genes, whatever word I want to use, all over the chromosomes, it, it 
gets changed as these telomeres get shorter. <clears throat> but still, it's no big deal when they shorten from 15,000 down to 10,000 bases. The problems are that we still have a lot of cell division, a lot of growing to do, and our telomeres get shorter and shorter. And when our telomeres get down to 5,000 bases, our cells lose the ability to function, and that's when we die of old age. And <clears throat> this has been every dish uh, over and over again. It's been shown by taking tissues from people at different ages. This is a really, really accurate clock, and it's now been shown to affect every disease we've ever heard of. I don't know a single disease that you that I can't go to scientifically peer-reviewed journal studies and find that somebody hasn't shown that the uh, your ability to get the disease increases when your telomeres get short. Mm. Okay, now this is amazing. This is unbelievable. When you when you heard this, you must have like fallen over when he was discussing this. That, that, well, this at block. that time when when he was first discussing it, nobody knew was this a result of aging or a cause of aging. Okay, so right. it could be just like our shoelace caps get shorter as a result of aging. So that's what I did is I went up to him before he even got off the podium and I said, has anybody figured out how to lengthen them to see if it's actually the cause of aging? Because if you lengthen them, and you should see a reversal of aging. And he, right. said, he said, they've been working on it for years and hadn't been able to figure out anything. And I said, God, he, I've been involved, as I said, in a lot of blockbusters. I said, let me join you and I'll, I'll have it figured out in three months. And uh, huh. three months and 17 days later, I had actually discovered an enzyme called human telomerase. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll come back to it in a second, but I just want to say that before this, before we talk about that, there are now thousands of scientific peer-reviewed journal studies confirming that telomere length controls the aging process in humans. And if anybody tells you otherwise, they're lying or somebody because this is now very solid fact. There are other things that cause us to age, but, but they, they, they're relatively minor relative to telomere shortening, and they're absolutely major in some other animals, like all rodents. Rodents don't age by telomere shortening at all. Humans and rodents are just two totally different type of animals, and that's one of the reasons I object to all the rodent, mice, and rat research, because it really has nothing to do with humans. It might, after we solve the telomere shortening problem, we might find out that we suffer from mitochondria dysfunction just like mice do. But until then, we got to solve this telomere shortening problem. Um, it sounded like you were going to say something. Let me, let me, yeah, I was actually, um, and this is probably to relates to what you were saying about mice, but, but when you look at like a dog or a cat where their lifespan is so much shorter, if you were to analyze that, their, their telomeres, are they, are they being uh, used up yes. much quicker as well? In fact, the they are. telomere theory of aging ex predicts very well about why as short as they do, uh, and et cetera. It, it turns out that uh, it, research at University of Texas Southwestern has looked at a lot of different animals. And they've only identified, I think it's seven or eight animals that actually age like humans do from telomere shortening. And it turns out to be coincidentally, some of our favorite pets. Okay, so it's dogs, cats, horses, sheep, pig, deer, uh, and then primates, other primates besides humans. Uh, other animals, they age by entirely different aging and uh, or they don't have any detectable aging. There's actually animals on this planet like lobsters, tortoises, humpback whales, clams. They have no detectable aging process at all. Uh, they, they don't get cancer. They don't get heart disease, uh, not heart disease. They don't get any kind of disease at, at, at high rates. They, of course, they get diseases at small rates, but they don't get, sure. it's very reduced. And, it's, and it turns out all those animals I just mentioned don't have telomere shortening. Their telomeres stay long because of the that I discovered called telomerase. They have this enzyme produced in every cell of their body. Humans only have it produced in their reproductive cells. And that's so that their children are born with as long a telomeres as they had when they were born. Otherwise, our children would be born old. So, uh, I mean, there, are, there, there is a disease, isn't there, where some of the children are, are born aged and they age very rapidly. I it's called progeria, uh, progeria Huntington, right. Huntington's Guilford disease. And uh, that is to be caused by accelerated telomere shortening. Uh, it's, so it was. Oh, my God. This is unbelievable. Yeah. So so my research should be a cure for their, that disease. Now, it's been shown that the reason why their telomeres are short is because of a mutation to a nuclear membrane protein called lamin A. 
But despite that, even with that mutation, by just le lengthening the telomeres with this enzyme telomerase, we should be able to allow those kids to live normal lives. Um, <clears throat> but the, uh, the fact is, is that produce, that's the thing is, how do you produce telomerase inside of our cells? Uh, we already have a gene for it. The gene's just on shut off. Every gene has is turned off and on like a light switch. But what we have been, we, we've focused on every different approach we can imagine to do this. But what we've been focusing mostly on late, lately is a, a method of gene delivery called gene therapy. And uh, uh, gene therapy is a way of like causing, like think of a human cell like a soap bubble and you make another soap bubble that has telomerase in it or the gene for telomerase. Okay. And like every kid knows, when two soap bubbles fuse, come together, they fuse and become one, and the contents of that little one goes inside the big one, and you get one big. But that's that's a way that we're using to deliver uh, the telomerase gene to human cells in a petri dish. And we just I just announced uh, uh, less than a week ago in uh, Istanbul that... Uh, we have just now, well, we signed a deal with a company called Labella Gene Therapeutics uh, a while back, and they have just gotten approval to start doing phase one clinical research, clinical studies using our gene therapy. Uh, and so wow. I'm, I'm really excited because this will be the first proof of concept that, that uh, lengthening telomeres will actually reverse aging and reverse decline in health. We don't want a lot of unhealthy old Right, and now you you know that you're also saying that there were uh, human skin cells that were grown in petri dishes where they did apply something like this. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, that was that research was like 20 years ago. That's where when we first discovered telomerase, we were growing human skin cells, uh, particularly fibroblasts, but it was also done with keratinocytes in petri dishes. And we found when we put them in the telomerase gene into it and lengthened the telomeres, these cells became young in every way. But that was later repeated with uh, human skin grown on the back of a mouse. And then uh, Dr. Rhonda Pinnell at Harvard uh, did this with with mice. I, I'd mentioned mice don't age by telomere shortening, but it's, it's actually fairly straightforward how to engineer a mouse so that it does age by telomere shortening. And uh, when the, these engineered mice were constructed that age just like humans. Uh, <clears throat> he was able to reverse their aging uh, just by uh, inducing uh, by by using gene therapy essentially to to deliver telomerase to. Uh, that was that so, was so we've already had so this has already been done at some level. Now we're actually taking it to human trials yeah. for the most part. Is that correct? The, the problem with gene therapy in the past has been that it was too unsafe on its own, regardless of whether it was the telomerase gene or some other gene, gene therapy had too many side effects. But now gene therapy has been perfected and we've been working with a gene therapy method for over five years now, maybe eight years, that is showing no side effects at all. There's actually over a hundred clinical studies underway now. Uh, people are delivering other genes and uh, using this gene therapy approach and they're not seeing any side effects. Uh, so, so Labella Gene Therapeutics licensed the gene technology, gene therapy from us. Uh, and uh, they're, they're actually beginning clinical studies in four days from now. So November 6, 2017, they're gonna have clinical studies being done at both Scripps Clinic in San Diego and at, in, at a, a, a Cartagena Hospital in Columbia. And, and I'm very excited about this because I'm actually thinking, believing that we are going to actually see an old person become young again in every way imaginable. Are you kidding me, Doc? Are you kidding me? This is unbelievable. All right, let me ask you a question. Has, has, have you, is this the first time this is being announced on, on this show? Or has this no, no, been, it, have it, you announced it? I announced it in, in uh, uh, Istanbul, Turkey, uh, on November twenty, on October twenty seventh, and that was the very first announcement ever. Uh, actually, the day before, I announced it on the what's it, the newspaper Hurriyet in Istanbul, but also uh, uh, Gentleman's Quarterly, Elle Magazine, 
uh, CNBC, CNN. I announced it on all those, uh, but the, the stories actually didn't come out until after my presentation in Istanbul. I, I spoke. I spoke to the Congress. I mean, aesthetics isn't my major focus, but <laughs> believe me, people in the aesthetic field are very interested in anything. That oh yeah. The process. And, and Bill, what, let me. How would you? Let's let's say the experiment goes as planned, right? Yeah. What would you? How, what would you see? Are you are you taking a seventy year old person and? They would just start going backwards in time. So instead of becoming seventy-one, they become sixty-nine. Or how would that? Yeah, how would that I actually, work? believe it or not, it sounds science fiction. But I'm, that's what I'm betting that we're actually going to see uh, an eighty-year-old person become equivalent to a forty-year-old person. Uh, it, oh my! I, I don't know God. how long it's going to take. This is all. Remember, this will be a phase one clinical study, which is normally just a safety study, but. Uh, we, 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 we won't know how it's going to work, how fast it's going to work, anything until we try it. And if it doesn't work, you know, it's back to the drawing board to figure out what's not working because it does work really well in everything else we do it on. So I'm expecting it to work. Now, keep in mind, <clears throat> we aren't going to be Benjamin Button situation uh, because <laughs> aging and development are two separate things. So, so Humans essentially quit developing when they're 24, about 24 years old. And then after that, all they do is age. So all we're going to do is be able to go back to 24. Nobody's going to go back to being a baby. Okay, that's right, right, right. in development. We're only reversing aging. So, so the idea is that people are going to get healthier and younger looking and younger feeling and happier. Um, but the, as I said, the, the, the clinic is going to begin on November 6th. Uh, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to be screening candidates. So they're they're actually looking for candidates right now, uh, and it, they're going to screen candidates and also do baseline studies with the idea of delivering the gene therapy to these patients beginning in March of 2018. And then I know that wow. the clinical study is going to monitor them for at least a year. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's all along the way to find you know, look for whatever is changing and anything like that. Uh, side effects are expected whatsoever. Uh, there's been nothing ever published in any scientific peer-reviewed journal of any kind that, that, that this will cause any negative side effects at all. Uh, so I'm, I'm very optimistic, everything. Now, if people want to follow this, uh, the, yeah, said, how would they do that? the company's name is Labella Gene Therapeutics, but their website is Labella Clinical Trial. And let me just spell that. It's L I B E L L A and then uh, dot com. Um, now that's. And if somebody wanted to, is there some way to volunteer for this or they've already. Yeah, like, no, how, how does The problem is this is this is the part I, I don't like, uh, but I, it, I don't see an alternative. The problem is that it costs, when we estimate how much it would cost us to produce enough of the gene therapy to treat one person once, that's making all these small little soap bubble things. Uh, right, right. So it's going to cost us one point two to produce enough of it to treat one person once. So this is going oh, to be wow. a very expensive clinical trial. So the the labella is is asking people, the volunteers, to pay for it. Okay. So this clinical study right. is not, my my goal in life was never just a find a way to make the wealthy live a long time. But it's still a, <laughs> still a proof of concept that we get to know that this works sure. and stuff. And that's what I'm really excited about. So so they're, they're going to be charging some uh, large number of dollars to, to, for, for people to participate in this study. Uh, and I know that it's going to have to first be that they have to pay some of the money up front uh, to pay for the production of the gene therapy. And then, then after the, it's produced and it's ready to be treated, they have to pay more to pay for all the hospital costs and doctor visits and tests and things like that. Um, right, right. So, so I, I'm not. I don't think it's a, a you know, the clinical study is going to be a profitable thing. It's just all the right, right. And made is going to be spent on doing the clinical study. But uh, I, I uh, let me. Let me well, let's say that it goes perfectly, right? And and you, you start to see a reversal in aging. When would you anticipate that they could actually mass produce this at a point that the price would come down and that we would actually see this in the general public? 
Well, it, it something like gene therapy, I just don't see it actually becoming ever affordable by everybody. And so I'm I I I'm looking at the because because part of the money that comes in will be used on our research. And I'm gonna focus my research on finding an alternative to gene therapy that would be less expensive. And I believe we've already been doing years of like natural product and pharmaceutical drug development uh, <clears throat> to find things. And we haven't gotten to the point of where we can get age reversal, but we have gotten to where we can pretty much slow the aging process down significantly. I think we, it, we only need to go up about six fold further pharmaceutical research at least, uh, probably maybe uh, 200 fold in our natural product research uh, to get something potent enough to actually reverse aging. And I think the, uh, the money from the clinical studies will help us get there. But uh, um, it's, it's uh, gene therapy, because to produce this, you have to actually grow, you know, grow cultures of human cells inside of 2000 liter bioreactors and that's expensive, and then harvesting the cells and breaking open the cells to reduce, get those soap bubble things out and things like that. That's that's really really expensive. So I don't see a way just to bring the fact that this is even just the fact that this is even possible, just the fact that this isn't science fiction is mind blowing. It is mind blowing. What Dr. Let me ask. You, I'm going to have somebody on about a molecule called carbon sixty yeah. that I've been hearing about recently. Um, are you familiar with that at oh, all? Oh yeah, very, very much. I, I but because of my interest in the uh, nanotechnology field uh, and the big, like, what is it? Years ago, 20 years ago or more, uh, the big almost like contest in the world was to see if somebody could make a a sphere out of carbons, okay? And and the it, it the when somebody finally did it was called the Bucky Ball. B U C right 19, I think it was 1985 or something like that. Yeah. And then and then the big mission became like a Bucky tube because the Bucky tube now would be great for these miniature computers to transport information uh, through really microscopic channels. And you know, so I was I was uh, it was I want to call it the use the word nerd, okay? Because it was a kind of a nerd <laughs> thing to do. There was no there was no really benefit from doing all this work, but a lot of people took on the challenge just because they were excited, just like computer nerds. You know, they, they want to do everything they can, but it's not always focused on trying to make it useful. It's just doing fun. You know, it was almost like playing a computer game, but developing these designs. Now, I'm personally, so 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 they got the Bucky ball, they got the Bucky tube, and then all these people who had spent all these years doing all this work and stuff like that, I guess started saying, oh, well, now what? <laughs> Is there any useful? Is there anything we can do with this that would be useful? And so I don't know. I I I I've been following it, but I any really data that convinces me that C60 or fullerene or whatever you want to call it, the buckyball, actually does anything. Okay, and I'm not. That doesn't mean it doesn't. It's just that it means I haven't taken the time out. But I'm just surprised that here's something that everybody discovered that now they're looking for a use for, and suddenly they're finding lots of uses for it. I, you know, I, I just, it's, it's a, trying to justify all the research and try to make some, make a bunch of money. And I, I, I just don't understand how the fullerene could, the C60 could be um, affecting aging and other health related things. But I can't, I, I can't say it doesn't work because I, it would take too much of my time to stop what I'm doing now and, and go and research it. But and research, okay, yeah, because that, that what I had heard and one the reason we were going to go start interviewing people for it was that it it basically they were talking about it in terms of the telomerase, but that it stopped it from breaking it down, but it didn't reverse it. Like that was almost the concept. And here's the concept I got that you, basically when you age, it's almost like you're rusting, and for some reason this carbon 60 stop that oxidative process is that totally baloney or i don't know i don't know i just don't i haven't i the data that i've looked at is not very convincing to me okay uh but i haven't thoroughly i you know you'll see in a lot of like youtube videos and stuff like that when uh i will do when i when i want to ask a question does 
is coffee good or bad for you, or is ibuprofen good or bad for you, or is aspartame good or bad for you, I don't, I don't go with what everybody says in the press and hearsay and stuff like that. I go to the scientific peer-reviewed journals. I find at least 50 articles on the subject, research studies, and I kind of read them all and then just, you know, rank them into who says what. And in all cases, you know, 95% say one thing is true and 5% say the other thing is true. And when it comes to peer reviewed journals, I just say, well, that I go with the 95%, you know, and uh, gotcha. yeah. I, I just, there's amazing how many things like eggs and coffee and ibuprofen and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's like, you know, I, I actually believe aspartame might be, or like Diet Coke might be one of the healthiest drinks on the planet. You can't find the data that says that it's bad for you. I mean, there are some papers that say that, that it can cause brain damage, but when you actually look at the, go into the materials and method and the results of the studies and analyze them in detail, you find out that you have to drink like 30 cans of Diet Coke a day to get that kind of a, huh. and it's like, of course, anything you overdose on is going to cause you kind of problems. But I don't. I, I just don't want to. I can't answer the questions. I, I, no, no, I don't fine. drink that's Diet fine. Coke. I personally don't drink Diet Coke at all. I used to. Right. I quit drinking it, but, but, but for totally other reasons. Uh, uh, it's just. Uh, I don't know. I'm just a very health-oriented person, and uh, uh, I was actually more concerned about the carbonation and stuff like that than, than anything else. Understood. So what an interesting interview. Dr. Andrews, let me, as we start to wind down, I always ask yeah. the guests like what they think the holy grail of health would be. So I'm going to pose that question to you. What do you think the holy grail of health is? Uh, well, it's absolutely telomere. Telomeres. Keeping your telomeres long is the number one thing anybody can do to keep and keep their health or slow their health, uh, declining health in as much as possible. Um, <clears throat> but I got to add on to that. Okay, so telomeres, are actually one of the things that causes telomeres to shorten at an accelerated rate is inflammation. And so I believe the number one cause of aging is inflammation. And the number one cause of declining health is inflammation. And one of the major things that it targets is the, the telomere. But <clears throat> I personally lead what I call the zero inflammation lifestyle and diet. I, uh, I've read all the studies on, on uh, different things that cause inflammation and I've, I've learned to, you know, I'm a, I'm a vegan. I don't, I don't eat any uh, animal proteins only because they are known to be inflammatory. Uh, I don't care if they had a mother, if they had a face or had a mother, that kind of stuff. But I, I just don't eat the uh, uh, proteins in animals. That includes fish, chicken, uh, any kind of fowl, wow, uh, no anything like that. I also don't do dairy for the same reason. Um, I also don't, I mean, I'm a big fan of uh, Caldwell Esselstyn, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, who, who has done a lot of studies showing that oils interfere with, uh, 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 in, cause inflammation, and uh, you want to reduce those. I'm also, uh, Dr. Gundy is also talking about lectins uh, being something that you want to reduce as much as possible because they, they are kind of toxins to your body. But then, in addition to that, I've done blood work to identify all the foods that cause inflammation in me, and I just don't eat those foods. Um, and, I, and, and, you know, contrary to popular belief, I'm an ultramarathon runner, which some people believe is very inflammatory, but it's not if you do it properly. And that's what I believe, as I mentioned earlier, you know, if it quits being fun, quit. Uh, because I can, you know, people that... that uh, train and move, uh, you know, get longer and longer distance at a slow pace. What is, what is the word I'm looking for? They, 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 they don't overtrain. They don't push it. They just take it easy. They, they can build up to long distances without ever causing a lot of stress to their body. Stress comes from not being prepared, you know, running a marathon when you're not trained enough for it, things like that. Um, people I hang out with, runners and stuff like that, we, we go out and run 100 miles, and when we get done, we feel like we've practically done nothing. We could probably do another one. It's a- uh, Oh my God, that's unbelievable. That's unbelievable. So you, how long, somebody from a, uh, a, a, like not really being that active to running 100 miles, right? I know it varies, but are you talking like three years, five years, two years to 
to just grind, like to do it like you're saying, where they're not really killing themselves. They're doing it more at an enjoyable pace. I, I would say I, I would say a year isn't long enough. You gotta take, build yourself up slowly. Um, but in three years, anybody could be an ultra marathon runner uh, <clears throat> and having fun doing it. Um, I mean, I mean, there's uh, when I run ultra marathons. I don't always finish. I, sometimes if I feel like it's becoming too much of a struggle because maybe there was too much mud on the course or too many hills or something like that, I, I will just drop out and, and, and not feel bad at all. And because uh, I've, I've, I've broken, achieved every award in the sport, sport of ultra marathon, including a world record for the most run in one year. Um, wow. I, I just uh, don't need any more finishes. I just do it because I like the adventure. And that's the key thing is to focus on the fun part of it, the adventure, the socializing. I mean, I talk all the time if I'm with other runners and uh, uh, the uh, it, it's to do it. And so any it's not just running, it's, it's any endurance sport. And that includes bicycling, swimming, kayaking, windsurfing, it, you know, snow skiing, water skiing. It, it's like all these things are just really good for you if you just keep it fun. Um, and uh, so and I believe that that actually reduces inflammation. I, you know, somebody who runs wow. maybe once every two weeks training and then goes and runs a marathon will probably do pretty well, but the next day they'll be stiff as a board from inflammation. Somebody like right. every day uh, and uh, goes and runs a marathon, I won't feel like I did anything the next day. I mean, it's like I'll be ready to do a, another marathon or something. Um, <clears throat> I. It's it's uh, slow, slow and steady wins the race. Basically. Yeah, <laughs> you said well said. I love it. I love it. Dr. Andrews, I want to thank you so much for being on this show, sir. It was really amazing. It was I, I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much. This episode is sponsored by New Jersey Foot and Ankle Center in Orido, New Jersey. Remember, when you have a foot problem, you've got a foot doctor in the family. Weekend and evening appointments are available. Call us at 201-261-9445. Once again, that's 201-261-9445. Thanks for listening. Check out the show notes over at drdanspeaks.com. If you're loving the show, head over to iTunes and leave us a review, and we'll catch you next time.